He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. It is so good to see you out on this Resurrection Day morning. Welcome, one and all. I see many uh, family faces, many uh, new faces as well. And if you're here with us for the very first time, it is not by mistake. We believe it is God's kindness that has brought you here today with us. We're excited that you're joining with us on this uh, Easter Sunday. We have good news and a risen Savior. That is the theme of our worship today, as it ought to be every Sunday. Uh, today, you, as you have in your order of worship, it says in the very front, Resurrection Day service, but really, that is every Sunday. And we live and we gather because Christ is alive. He ever lives above, as that wonderful hymn says, and that is what gathers us here. We're glad that you're here with us. If you're with us for the first time, or the first time in a long time, we want to just give you a very special welcome, and our, our ushers would be happy to give you a little info card that you could fill out just to help us take a record of your attendance, but also so we can reach out to you and connect with you, see what it is that God is doing in your life and what it is that brings you here to be with us today. We'd love to walk with you in life as we all seek to keep in step, say, with the Spirit, as it says in the Word, as we seek to follow after our Savior Jesus. We're grateful to have you here today. I hope you have an order of worship. You'll need that as we walk through the service. Look to the back panel, though. You'll see some announcements I just want to direct your attention to of some things going on in the, the life of this church family. You saw a number of those things announced on our slides before the service uh, began just a few minutes ago. One thing I wanted to note is uh, this last week was a bit different in that we had our Good Friday service, which was really a sweet time, a solemn time, but a sweet time to gather in a uh, as, a, as a group of people to think about the Lord's death on our behalf and his burial uh, and really taking upon himself the wrath of God. Uh, today we celebrate an empty tomb and we're going to look to that in the text of John chapter 20 today. But we do resume this coming week, uh, our regular Wednesday night midweek service. We have a new series beginning for the men as we gather in this space here. You saw that on the slide. There's a QR code you could scan to get a free ebook copy of John Piper's book, 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. I think it's a good theme to keep in front of us as we live in the wake of Easter Sunday. Uh, if you have questions about that, see me. We'd love to talk to you about those opportunities. Ladies also resume their study through the book of Luke. And our youth will gather, uh, as, as uh, usual, on Wednesday night. So you won't want to miss out our small group time Wednesday midweek. Uh, it's a good time for us to pray and gather around the word together. A number of other things. Uh, one that I really want to mention that's coming up uh, this coming Saturday, which was originally planned for this last Friday, is our meal and music uh, uh, with Matthew Benedict uh, coming up this Saturday evening at 6 o'clock. There was a sign-up sheet in the hallway. Uh, it's a time for our young at heart to gather together. Really, any who want to come for a time of fellowship together, uh, do take note of that. And then uh, next week, beyond that, Penile Bible Camp, who we focused on as our ministry partners of the month just last month, uh, with both the Vanderscales and the McFarlands visiting with us. They mention in their meetings with us that they have a work week coming up. They're looking for volunteers. It's from Tuesday through Saturday, so maybe you have a day in the week that you could uh, donate your, your time, volunteer your skills. If you're interested in helping and partnering with them, uh, this is a camp located just north of Columbus, a little ways, uh, that we've had a long time relationship with. It would be an awesome opportunity for us as a church to represent and show uh, the love of Christ to these people who we've partnered with for so long. And then one other thing, I know you can read all these announcements, but we do have coming up at the end of this next month, which is almost here. <laughs> can you believe it? March has already <laughs> passed us, it seems. Uh, is the perfect friend, this mother, daughter, and friend luncheon. It's hosted at the Depot on Main. This will be Saturday, April 27th. We have a guest speaker coming in. If you have any questions about that, do see Miss Jeannie Stewart. She's put a lot of work into organizing that. It'll be a, an awesome opportunity for you and your family, but also ladies, reaching out to those ladies in your neighborhood, uh, that we would really be a witness and really reach out into our community in this sort of event. So you won't want to miss out on that. We have a, 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 a wonderful theme, as I said, as, as would be expected on an Easter Sunday. Uh, turn now, if you would, to the service of worship we have before us. The reality of a risen Savior, the Christ, our wonderful Savior, Jesus. Uh, we will sing of this truth. We begin triumphantly with the power of the cross. And I hope you'll join and sing well. We have text of scripture. We have the choir joining us and pointing us to the truth of Jesus alive today. And the hope that he brings us as we prepare our hearts for the word preached today. I hope you're ready. Let us stand and we sing together the power 
of the cross.
Let's continue in worship as we stand and sing our next hymn in our order of worship, Christ Arose. Our scripture reading this morning is in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. In your order of worship, would you read with me in the bold print as we proclaim God's word this morning? Colossians 2, 11 through 15. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sin of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. Read with me. And he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. As we come and we give back to the Lord in the way he's blessed, uh, let's rejoice in this Easter Sunday morning in what God has done. So gentlemen, if you come now at this time, let's give back to the Lord in the way he has so generously blessed us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love to us. Thank you for this day that we have come to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In him we have life everlasting. Lord, we thank you so much for that. I thank you for each and every one that is here this morning. Lord, I pray as the word of God is preached to our hearts that our hearts would rejoice in the goodness and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you now for this time, and we can give back a little to, to you for all that you have done for us. May you honor the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Let's stand together and sing the doxology. Direct your attention again to our order of worship for a newer hymn, Christ is Risen, He is Risen Indeed.
Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we are grateful for all that has been done on our behalf and the work of your Son, Jesus. He is our Savior. He is no dead Savior. He is a living Christ, one who has come and fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf in his living and in his death, Father. He took our place that we might be made your sons and daughters through faith in him. But this is only good news, Father, if his death was not the end of it all. But that the grave would be found, as he said, it would be empty on the third day. That He arose from the dead. And that, Father, even today, he's ministering on our behalf at your side. And so we, we come before you in his name, for he is before you even now. And his blood ever speaks on our behalf when we come and we seek mercy father we find an abundant supply for all who are here today who come with burdens they feel are just too heavy to continue to bear under father may they find comfort and release and peace in jesus who has made peace with you on our behalf father we thank you today also how the text before us will point us to the reality of uh, your dwelling among us even now by your spirit. Father, I pray that you would truly give us a special grace of understanding, of listening, of not being distracted by all that uh, culture and society would want to impose upon this day, or even this holiday, Father, how it's been tainted much by um, other sorts of, uh, you know, cultural experiences and activities, Father. May, as cherishing and as, as, as fun as those things can be, Father, may they, may they not obscure the true meaning as to why we are here today as your people. And may we be all the more grateful for the truth that we get to exercise in our thinking again today. We thank you for a Resurrection Sunday. And we ask, Father, a blessing on this service that your word now would speak, that I would decrease, but you would increase, Father, in the, ear, the hearing and, and the hearts of your people. I ask for um, all who are gathered, Father, both in this place and others like it, in this community and this around our nation, Father, and around the world this whole day, Father. Give them a grace of safety in gathering, for many do not enjoy that as we do so readily uh, here in this place. But also, Father, I ask for, for many who are visiting, perhaps even here today, who are just simply wanting to look in as to what it is that Christians believe about this day our society renders or understands as Easter. Father, I think is even more appropriately called Resurrection Sunday. Father, may people, not go, may, may people today not go away disappointed in who Jesus is, but may they take a full helping of him today in faith. I ask for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, and if you're with us here, perhaps for the first time, or the first time in a long time, uh, there's some right in the pew rack in front of you. The person next to you hopefully can help you find your place in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. And I don't want anyone to go out of here without a, a word, the word of the Lord for themselves. We have in our back corner here a kind of a track rack, book rack area with some Bibles. Take one of those for yourself as you go today as a gift from Fayette Bible Church to you. We want to make sure everyone can for themselves look to the word, and be guided by the spirit to understand that Christ is who all of life is all about. That's what we gather here for today. And by now, it's probably become very clear to you as to what Easter is all about. Our singing has, you know, drenched us in this reality of a risen Savior. We've talked about it. We've read about it in the text as well. We're going to hear about it. We're going to uh, immerse ourselves in this doctrine and this teaching through the entire part of this chapter here in John 20. Uh, we gather, though, on what we call Easter Sunday. Again, I would say it's more appropriately rendered as Christians as the a Resurrection Sunday. That's what we're really here about. And that this is a reality that brings us here every Sunday. This is why we, we do not observe the fifth commandment of, uh, of keeping the Sabbath. We keep the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. We gather as people of a risen Savior. It's a Christian day. And it's a day that we gather. And we come to a text here 
and we find the discovery of Jesus' closest, closest associates and followers, which picks up right where we left off. If you were with us Friday night at our Good Friday service, you heard me echo over and over again three indicators that just seem to make us, as readers to Matthew's gospel, just really wonder if the burial, and the death, and the burial of Jesus is the end of the story. And friends, there's another chapter to be read today that points to us that the, the, the story is not over. The story does not end with a tomb. And yet the discovery we read here in just a few moments is not one of delight initially by Jesus' closest followers. Rather, it begins as one of fear and of worry. Look with me at John chapter 20, verse 1. The text says this, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. And Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. And the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they, these two disciples, did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. But in that moment, something clicked, and they believed. But what do we read in verse 10? Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. As if the series of events that led up to our Lord's death and burial wasn't shocking enough for his closest followers, his 12 and many others, we read of a scene here in which the mystery appears to grow even greater. Now, if you've heard the Easter story before, you, you know where this is going, but if you could just isolate yourself to this scene, you're like, an empty tomb, great, but where is the body? Where is Jesus, our Lord? The plot seems to thicken. It's obvious that Mary suspects that Jesus' lifeless body simply has been stolen away. But for Peter and John, as we've read, this visit inside the tomb results in what? Faith and belief. Verses 8 and 9 make it clear that it's at this point that they finally connected all the dots of what Jesus had said about himself leading up to his death and his burial into a coming resurrection, it clicks for them that he said he would rise from the dead. Truly, just as we observed on Friday evening, all indications pointed in the direction that Jesus' burial was special, that it would not be, in fact, the end of the story of this rabbi from Nazareth, whose origin actually is from the, before the beginning of time. And especially as we saw all the things that he had said to the disciples leading up to. And I know we're jumping in, we did, as we did Friday night, we jumped into Matthew's gospel, and we're jumping into John's gospel here. But if we, and if you've ever read through the gospel of John, and if you, as we did through the gospel of Mark, you see these gospel writers are pointed in what they say. There's a, there is a message to be had, there is a theology, there's an understanding of God and of Christ that they want us to walk away with as believers. And there's been signposts, there's been, there's been uh, indications given by Jesus all along the way. In our text today, we see them all coming to pass. And so as we look through the text today, this chapter, we're going to see saying after saying in which we're called to, as readers, to think back to what Jesus has said before. That this isn't simply just an unfolding story like, okay, uh, as if the, the Christian group 
after Jesus had died, had to come up with some sort of narrative. No, this is a story that Jesus had said was going to unfold in detail. And so the disciples, what? When they enter that tomb, they realize he's not been stolen away. He, in fact, is risen, just as he said he would be. And this is key for us in remembering in the, these things. And I know, again, we're jumping in because it's, it's the framework in which John presents us this chapter. He frames all of it in faith, not just in the fact that, oh, I, I see what I see here and I guess that's true, but it's faith in what has been said, the word of Christ, what Jesus says is in fact true beyond a shadow of a doubt, even though the claims he made were supernatural. We're living in a day and an age in which the supernatural is, seemed, is discarded as obscure, as silly in our world, and yet that's the gospel we come to. It's a, the, the word we have, and the invitation I give to all of you to take home for yourself a copy of God's word, this is a supernatural book, friends. It is to be received by faith. And as we'll see here, faith that even, that's not rooted in what we see, but what it, in what Jesus has clearly said. Jesus had said and told his disciples up leading up to this chapter in chapter 20 of his betrayal. He talked about his death, that it was going to come. He talked about his burial, that it was going to come. But he also said things concerning a resurrection and of his ascension and also of the coming of his Holy Spirit. And these are things that, that John and Jesus packs in together right here in his appearing. When he shows up, as we'll see in the text to follow, he has a message. So far, though, we've come and we've discovered an empty tomb. And while this is enough to point Peter and John in the right direction of belief in the resurrection, others are left confused, like Mary Magdalene. Or they're doubting, like Thomas, as we'll see in our text to follow. Friends, we need more than simply an empty tomb. We need a risen Savior. And the gospel gives us both. What is it that keeps the story of the gospel and the teaching of a resurrected Savior from becoming this sort of abstract or distant truth for us? This sort of maybe taking on a fairy tale sort of uh, identity or connotation in our thinking. Friends, it's the reality of faith. That such a thing as we read here today, and as we will read in the verses to follow, that this is true. That Jesus is all that he said he truly is. The question pressing upon you today as you hear is, do you believe it? And this makes remembering, as we have even seen in the last several Sunday nights through our psalm series, remembering, even in our first Timothy chapter 4 series, remembering the word of Christ is so important to the Christian life. That we remember the messages of the texts. Because by the time we get to chapter 20, we find here three, there's three points to our sermon today. There's three messages Jesus gives in these three appearances he makes. He shows up three different times to three different groups, you could say, of people with a special message for each. And they are all to this end, that his word would do work in all who hear it. So the main idea of the message, friends, this morning is this. Your faith in the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, which we'll see today is actually just as important to, to emphasize on this day as the resurrection. The, 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 your faith in the ascension of Jesus, who is himself life, is the word at work in you. It, believe, it begins with the gospel of Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. And this goes against all slander of the devil in your own personal life that would accuse you that you are not worthy of such life, that you're not worthy of forgiveness, that he would slander you to make you think in your thinking that you are too far sinful for God to show his love to you in Christ. The gospel counters that, friends. But it also goes against all the critics of this world that, again, would discard this book that we have as, as, as nonsense because they give no 
They give no place for the supernatural. They give no place for the divine. Friends, your faith comes down to you and the book you have in front of you. What will you do with the message of a risen Savior? We begin this morning, we see our first point, is the message that we find Jesus delivering to Mary Magdalene. The message from Mary in verses 11 through 18. Continue with me. We see, but Mary, John and Peter had departed by this point. And how did you like that? John, and, if you, can we just look back up at uh, verse, uh, verse 4? You know, John is this other disciple. <clears throat> as he has written this gospel, he refers him to himself as typically the other disciple. And how do you like that? They both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. There's been a couple of really good memes about that where Peter's just like, really, John? Did you have to put this in scripture? Okay, yes, you got to the t- you're a faster runner than me. I think it's a, something to, to enjoy a little bit. But what we find here are disciples set on finding their Lord. And we see Mary, with not the clarity that John and Peter have had, still in verse 11, standing outside the tomb, weeping. Verse 11 goes on, And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting one on the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? But she said to them, because they, she again thinking that there were some grave robbers, that the Jewish authorities had probably done this, who, who had set the guard, as we saw when, uh, Friday night, because they had taken away my Lord, and I do not know where he has laid. Now, When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus, verse 15, said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that they had spoken these things to her and that he had spoken these things to her. The message for Mary Magdalene, as we'll see, just really in in taking the sum of this scene in, we find this message is that the Son, Jesus, was raised in order to rise, to ascend. The ascension of Christ is the first thing on the lips of Christ as he speaks to his follower, Mary, this one who's been faithful to him in so many ways for so long and through such dark episodes of her own life. The message for Mary and for us to embrace today, first of all, is that the Son is alive. (laughs) He has been raised. And he's done so in order to rise and to ascend, that is, to heaven. He goes to the Father. He goes to our God. And as we, if we were to recall, as we'll see other verses, Jesus says, if I go, I will go to prepare a place for you. These things are coming to mind in the hearts and the hearing of Mary and as we'll see the other followers of Jesus. The message, first of all, is that the sun was raised in order to rise. This is the first scene in which the words and actions of Christ are meant to flood back to our memory. It's in this intimate scene with Mary that we're meant to recall Jesus' previous exchange with Mary. When was this? It was near a different grave. Near the grave of her brother, Lazarus, in which he told her in John 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You see how the scenes here seem to, this seems to be an echo of something if we would have read through the entire Gospel of John in this setting today. We don't have time for that. I encourage you to do that. 
that this, this is the last interactions he had with Mary. You see, John's been on a mission for you and I as he writes the gospel for us, this, this record of Jesus' life for us. And he has for you and I as, as readers to, to believe that there is life in Jesus. And not just any good life in which society, or if we think of people who've lived good lives, we think of people with lives who what society or culture would have, they, they might admire the legacies that we leave up behind us. No, 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 this isn't the good life Jesus is talking about. He's not, he's not also talking about a blessed life as far as the world or our creaturely comforts might suggest. In fact, Jesus said the other, otherwise for his followers that there will be testing and persecution. No, the life Jesus speaks of is life abundant, life eternal, life that goes beyond as he demonstrated at Lazarus' grave and also at his own. It's life that goes beyond death. It's eternal life. And this is the point of the final sign Jesus gave of his majesty and when, he rose, uh, when he rose Lazarus from the dead. So that believing in him, though we, as we join in with Mary, though we may die, we shall live in him, friends. This is tr- there are uh, tremendous parallels between the miracle at Lazarus' tomb and the scene before us here in John 20. And we're meant to remember these things. Because it's meant to show that the grave is not the end of the story. And Jesus isn't trying to pull this out of nowhere on his followers. No, they should have seen it coming. That's what we considered on Good Friday. The, the signs of his burial pointed to a different ending. First of all, we see that in Lazarus' story, and in this here, a period of three days are observed before the dead are raised. Secondly, At Lazarus' tomb, Jesus asks Mary, where have you laid him? Talking about Lazarus. Here, Mary, suspecting Jesus to be the gardener, makes request of him. Tell me where you have laid him. There's also this removal of a stone mentioned about both tombs, at both resurrections. Though Lazarus' resurrection really pales in comparison to Jesus' Because Lazarus would die again. Jesus, on the other hand, ever lives. But this stone being rolled away, it serves to guarantee that no mischief, no deceit should, should, should be suspected of what takes place when the dead are raised. Lazarus being raised is genuine, and so Jesus' resurrection, he being the one who calls the dead out of the grave, is the true resurrection. He himself is resurrection and life. And in that context of John 11, he says what I am. This is the fifth of so many I am statements in John's gospel. It's speaking to God himself, bringing life to all who would believe in him. Friends, it's not enough simply to believe that there is a resurrection. The Pharisees believe that. In contrast to the Sadducees, right? The old joke is the Sadducees are sad, you see. Because they don't believe in an afterlife, in a resurrection. But that's counter to the other groups of Jewish followers and devotees, like the Pharisees. They believed in a resurrection, but that's not enough, friends. And we have a lot of people in our world today who think of an afterlife. And they can give you a myriad of ways. There's a whole spectrum of ways in which we come up with how you get there and what you get on the other side. Friends, that is contrary to the Christian teaching of the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Elsewhere in John's gospel, no man comes to the Father but by me. I am the resurrection and the life. We need more than an empty tomb. We need a risen Savior, and that Savior is one. It's Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, our Savior, the Son of God, come down. Life is only to be found in Jesus alone, friends. To be in Jesus is to pass from death to life, just as he had. Though we die in our mortal bodies, we will live beyond the grave in Christ. This is an encouragement to us, is it not, friends? As we live in a world, as we live in a nation that is embracing a culture of death in so many ways. Death even before precious little ones are even born. Death in which our society is embracing this uh, supposed doctrine of euthanasia. Friends, we have life beyond death. 
We need not need such means to seek to take control of, uh, of our own living and dying. We commit these things to the Savior who is himself, resurrection and all goodness in life. And so, friends, the application, first of all today, this first point is this. Faith in Jesus is to have eternal life. We're going to come back to this at the end of this chapter. This is the point of John's gospel. This is the good news of the empty grave. To have faith in Jesus is to, to not have to fear death. This is the message of his appearing to these followers. This is the teaching of the apostles as we opened our, our breakfast time down in the cafeteria. I read from the Apostles' Creed where they affirmed this teaching. It's in Jesus alone. And so, friends, cling to this truth. And as Jesus speaks to Mary, who is evidently, it's like he's clinging to him, we see here in the text, right? He tells her in verse 17, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and your God. Now, when Jesus says to Mary, don't cling to me, I think we can maybe do a lot of things in our thinking about this scene. Like, don't touch me, you're going to ruin everything, Mary. No, that's not what's happening here. Jesus is indicating to Mary that she's not to presume that just because he's appeared to her, he's going to be here long term. Say, Mary, don't, don't cling to me. I, I'm going to the Father. There could be a sort of, there's obviously a desperateness here and her compassion for the Lord to see him, to be with him. But there also could be beyond that, this anticipation that like at the Mount of Transfiguration, hey, it's time to set up some tabernacles. We're going to initiate a kingdom here. Jesus is saying, it's, it's not going to happen now. I'm going to go to the Father. And John has alluded to this. So again, we're, we're supposed to remember things John has said all along the way. In his high priestly prayer, he, he, he prefaced that prayer to the Father with these words in John 16. He says, a little while and you will not see me. Right? He's buried. And again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. The way John, in this gospel, forecasts the ascension as an integral part of Jesus' teaching, especially as it relates to what we'll see next, the coming of the Comforter, the Spirit of God. As Jesus is absent from the earth, in this age in which you and I find ourselves now, we have God with us by the Spirit. This is important, friends, that Jesus doesn't leave us just unhinged from what he said beforehand. Where he just disappears and he's gone. He's here to meet with these followers, but to tell them a new age is coming. A time in which he will be gone, and yet the Spirit will come. And this is important because there will be critics today, as there have been for millennia now, who will say of Christianity, man, that's convenient. That's real convenient that you say Jesus arose from the grave and that he ascended. Oh, well, he's not here. <laughs> But again, this is not something we've concocted. This is something Jesus himself, before, any, before his death and his burial, said would happen. There's witnesses of it. This is a truth, friends. And this is where you and I need to appreciate what Jesus delighted to share with us in his absence. His very spirit. As he calls him in other contexts, the comforter, the one who leads and guides us into what is true because the word of God is truth, right? He will be one who testifies of Jesus. Jesus is the exposition. He is the show of God to mankind. And the Spirit's job description, you could say, is to glorify the Son, to point us to Jesus. And so, friends, the other application of this first point as we think about this message to Mary, of the Son coming but rising from the dead so that he would rise into the sky and to the Father. This application is that we treasure the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think it's easy for us to think that maybe the Spirit, the age in which we live, means that we're living some sort of second-rate Christian experience. Have you ever thought that, where it's like, man, I wish, oh, oh to be one of those people who saw the resurrected Jesus with my own eyes. As if to say that today is second rate, that we missed out on something great. No, friends, Jesus in his prayer for us, and he's praying for us in John 
16 and 17, is that we would delight in the joy, the joy that he has for us to live not by sight, but to live by faith. By faith in his precious word. And this is the point Jesus makes by his two appearances next in our text as we come to point number two. The second message we find are to those who see him. And Mary certainly could be included in this group, but we find a separate meeting of Jesus as he meets with the disciples. Of course, Thomas being absent. Look with me now at verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And what's the message that comes? Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. The second message we find here today is that the Son was sent in order to send out others, his people. He goes on, verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this, the Spirit comes at a later time, but this is Jesus indicating to them that they go out in his power. It's coming. There's other, the other gospel writers tell us that they are to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of of any, they are retained. This, of course, speaking, I think, best to be understood, what we find to be church discipline. But he goes on, verse 24, Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. We have here this scene where Jesus makes himself known to his closest associates that have been lived with him for three years or more. These 12 are really the remnant of the 12. Thomas notably absent. Judas also absent from this group. But John doesn't give much more than simply a greeting, a commission, and some simple instructions. Verse 21 reads again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Which is to mean, uh, and to work in these men a life that is on mission. You know, just, it's like as if they're like, oh, whoa, okay, yeah, let's get right to work. And they're like, oh, okay, have you ever been like, you're trying to take in information while you're also called to act upon that information? <laughs> Jesus commissions them as soon as he sees them. He gives them a greeting, but then he sends them out. Again, we're to recall what Jesus had already said, and John had done this in his gospel in chapter 17. He's prayed this thing for them, that they would go out in his name. Look at verse, uh, if you were to look to John 17, verse 17, it's te the text says this, as he prays to the Father, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus comes and he initially is just giving them, he's giving them marching orders. And I think we need to remember this on a holiday even, in which maybe we just think we can sit and just relish this truth. Please do this, friends. And we'll, we're getting to the last two verses of this chapter in which we see the purpose statement of this whole gospel. It leads us to that point. But recognize that this truth is meant to send us out as agents of a gospel that the world will see to be crazy, as obscure. Why are we still going on and on about this Jesus who was here on earth 2,000 years ago? We're given marching orders, friends. The, the disciples and all who, are, who follow in their doctrine are to go into the world as agents and ambassadors of the truth. Not just in their own wisdom or in their own might, but sanctified by the word. They're to be people of the Bible, of the text, the word of Christ, which is why Jesus then breathes on them the key to them understanding what is true. The Holy Spirit, who is described back in John 17 as the one who guides them in the truth, the word of God. And so what about you and me? 
we weren't in this room to see Jesus or receive this message, and neither was Thomas. And this situation really provides them the perfect setup for John in getting to the purpose statement of his writings. We'll see thirdly now the message for those who have not seen. This is the message ex expressly to you and I today. So as far as I know, none of us in here are eyewitnesses of the risen Lord. But we're all here today because we've received what? We've received word of a risen Lord. And so we find with uh, Thomas, I think, a, uh, a, a, a companion. <laughs> and so let's learn from his, uh, his fault, we could even say here in this text. Let's be the beneficiaries of that. Look at verse 26. It says, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your hands and reach your hand here. Or look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The third message of, our, of this chapter are for those who have not seen, like Thomas, who God gives a, a vision here to prove the point for all of us today who have not seen Jesus and yet read of him, have heard of him, that we would what? Be not unbelieving but that we would believe the word that we have received. This gospel, this Christian message that has shaped the world, friends. Thomas typically gets the, a bad rep. <laughs> but really, it could be said that the other disciples were no different than him a few days before. Am I right? Regardless, Thomas represents really the plight of all of us who come upon the gospel, all who have the gospel preached to them, everybody since the first century, ever since the end of the apostolic era, as we call it. What if you weren't an eyewitness of the resurrection? Well, we find an ally here in, Th in Thomas. And again, we can benefit from his mistake, this gracious, this gracious reconciliation of Jesus to him helps us realize that we have a tremendous joy before us to believe, having not seen him, and that a greater, fuller anticipation awaits us in his resurrection because of this. And so what we find here as we come then to the end of this chapter, verse 30 and 31, we see John now giving us an aside as to why he's written this. He's come 20 chapters. He says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. Why? Here it is. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Friends, as we consider these last two verses here, we find a two-pronged emphasis of faith. One, it's for those who might believe, first of all, and maybe I'm speaking to some today, who this is Easter Sunday. If you're ever going to go to church, it's one of two holidays. Which is it? It's either Christmas or Easter, right? There's some who say you got your Cheester Christians out today. Well, can I say to you, whether you're here for the first time, or maybe your hundredth time, or your thousandth time. Friend, if you've never come to have faith in a risen Savior, Jesus, all man and yet all God, the one who lived a perfect righteous life, fulfilling the law, the righteous demands of God upon mankind, that we could only live under in despair, seeing our sin exposed, Jesus exposed as being true righteous. And all goodness. There's no fault to be found in him. And yet, he died on our behalf. He is God's love to us, friends. And if, you've not, if you do not receive Christ, friends, the love of God is not upon you. Jesus is the love of God. Do not let it pass beyond you today. Receive faith in Jesus today that he is 
the Christ, the chosen one, the one whom the, the Old Testament was prophesying of, who would fulfill the law, and that he's also more than just a human champion. He is the Son of God. And that believing in him, there's life in him because he has been resurrected. And he offers this resurrection to you as well. Friends, it's for those who first believe. But also, we see here that this faith in verse 31 is to speak of those who have already believed that we would continue in this gospel. So the question for us in application, friends, is this. Who is the gospel for? Is it for unbelievers or Christians? There's one answer. Yes! <laughs> the gospel is the, is the reality that we must remind ourselves, we must preach to ourselves every day, brothers and sisters in Christ, because we often wake up, what, living and a mentality that would look to the appeals of this world. And we need to be reminded of a life we have in Christ that sets us, as Jesus set his 12, or the 10 in that room at least, to live on mission. But also to those who today, who are listening to this, and they've never heard of Christ. Friend, it's as I say often with the communion table, Maybe you're here on an Easter Sunday thinking that this is going to get you some good points with God. Maybe you think that coming and participating as we do what the beginning of every month in the Lord's Supper or getting baptized, that's going to get you righteous points with God, right? Friend, no. Don't partake of any sort of religious opportunity. Partake instead of Jesus today in faith. He is the appeal of God to you today. Not some sort of religious system that you can climb your way to him. It's through faith alone, by grace, that we are reconciled to God. And it is never too late, friends. It is never too late. You are never far too gone. His mercy never ends. His blood has been spilt for all who would look with faith and believe. And yet we're left wondering at the end of this chapter, and we think about John's purpose statement, and we're like, okay, we're reading this 2,000 years later. Why so long of a wait, Jesus. <laughs> Why is there such a long wait? Have you ever asked that? Why are we still... Why, why the ascension? Why couldn't Jesus appear and then just set up his kingdom then? Why not, right? It would kind of seem like, well, that could work. Well, first, we've already answered why the ascension is important. It serves as the precursor of the coming of the Spirit which again, friends, is not providing to you and I a second-rate Christianity. But rather, he, it calls us to remember the purpose of this age that we live in, that we call the church age. It's distinct from the Old Testament, is it not? And what is a particular thing that sets us apart from the Old Testament? Is the people of God is no longer condensed or understood strictly within what? The Jewish or Israel religious system. To answer the question of why so long, I simply want to quote John's fellow gospel writer, Luke, who speaks of this period of waiting that you and I feel re readily, right? <laughs> Luke chapter 21, verse 24, this period of waiting until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Why did Jesus rise to rise in his ascension? Friends, so that the appeal of the gospel would reach the uttermost parts of the earth, places like Washington Courthouse, Ohio. And I'm grateful for it. And I pray that you are today. And if you're here today and you've not yet received Jesus, friend, there is no better day than to receive the truth of a risen Savior, Jesus Christ, than on the day that we mark, that we remember that he was risen from the dead and he ever lives and intercedes on our behalf. As that text in Colossians that we read says, our sins, all who are in him, are nailed to the cross, and they've been written away. They've been blotted out by the blood of Christ. And he made an open show of all who would slander such a gospel. He triumphs over him in it. And that's the gospel that we bear today. And friend, I hope if you're here today, that you've made an opportunity for you to believe for in believing there is life in his name.
Without Jesus, friends, there is no life. There's some sort of semblance of it that we see witnessed in our world. And many of us, for many, for maybe for far too long, have enjoyed the season of life that we can call living in this world. But without Jesus, friends, there is no life beyond the grave. There is no hope. There is hope only in Jesus Christ. That's in his name that we gather and that we even now pray. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you today for resurrection hope in Jesus for this gospel that we preach, this gospel that we cling to, that it points us back to the word, that, that we don't live beyond the word. We live in the word, that we're, we're, we're stuck joyfully in this cycle of seeing your word coming to pass and dominating and triumphing in our living day after day after day. And Father, for some today, they've never tasted of such life. They've never known such joy. I pray, Lord, that there would be much rejoicing today, that they would find in Jesus their Savior through faith. Father, I pray a blessing on this time as we go from this place, and even as we sing now, glorious hallelujah for what you have done. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we close? We'll sing all the verses of him. 184, man of sorrows, what a name, for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim Hallelujah! What a Savior. Mark, please come. who has gone and this revelation has come again and he says this in verse 6 it is done I am the Alpha and Omega this Jesus the beginning and the end I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I shall be his God and he shall be my son but the cowardly unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Friends, Jesus offers us as the resurrection and the life hope beyond the grave and of the second final death. Friend, if you're here today, please come. Let us talk. Let's have a conversation about knowing Jesus, knowing how you can stand before God clean of all these sins listed here and more in Christ through faith in him. And as we all go from here, let's live on mission. Even today, as we gather our friends and family, let us speak of our wonderful Savior, Jesus. Blessings to you as you go. No service tonight. Gather and celebrate together. We hope to see you out Wednesday night. Blessings.